morning and thank you for joining us on Future TV. I'm Linda Tamim and these are today's top stories. The Lebanese army begins fortifying its security measures in Tripoli in an attempt to control the situation in the city. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry reiterates that Israel's security is a top priority in talks with Iran. And at least 30 people are feared dead as a suicide bombing rocks Yemen's defense ministry complex in the capital. The Lebanese army has begun fortifying its security measures in the northern city of Tripoli in an attempt to control the situation in the city a day after gunmen seized activity and cautious calm prevailed. The national news agency says the army removed obstacles and barricades set by gunmen near Al Ahram movie theater near Starco, Jabal Mohsen's axis. The source also reported that normal traffic returned to the markets of the city. The army later issued a communique pointing out that Rami Saifuddin Hassoun and Bilal Nasser Hassoun were detained over several arrest warrants and for opening fire on several occasions. The statement added that Abdul Hamid Muhammad Awad was also arrested for assaulting another compatriot on Wednesday morning and attacking a soldier earlier. Speaker Nabih Birri has held talks with Army Commander General Jean Ahwaji to discuss the security plan drafted to restore order in Tripoli, where the military made more arrests of gunmen in the embattled northern city. Ahwaji and Birri also discussed the recent security developments in the country at the Speaker's Hainatine office. Prime Minister Najib Binkati has instructed the specialized agencies to deal with the chaos on the streets caused by heavy rains and asked security apparatuses to be on standby for more storms. Binkati's instructions came as Lebanon witnessed a second day of total chaos on the streets, mainly in Beirut and its suburbs. Heavy rains flooded many of Lebanon's roads, causing bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic across the country, notably on the airport road where drivers were trapped by meter-high water. The highway was consequently blocked by security forces, along with several other, other roads such as Marm Khayil and Babda thoroughfares. The Israeli army went on alert on the border with southern Lebanon over fears that Hezbollah could retaliate over the assassina assassination of a top official, which it blamed on the Jewish state. The national news agency says Israeli troops carried out patrols along the border and monitored the Lebanese side. Israeli drones reportedly overflew the areas of Sheba Farms, El Abbasi, and Rajar. Also on Lebanon's side of the border, UN peacekeepers intensified their patrols along the UN drawn blue line. Hash Hassan Halo El Lakis has been shot repeatedly with a silenced handgun near his house in the Saint Therese neighborhood in Hadas, south of Beirut. The United Nations and the Global Chemical Weapons Watchdog say they are awaiting approval from a country to use its port to load Sierra's most deadly chemicals onto a U.S. ship for destruction offshore. This is according to Sigrid Kog, head of the Joint Mission of the United Nations and the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, Syria Mission, who briefed the U.N. Security Council but did not identify which country she had been in talks with. The OPCW says the United States had started modifying a U.S. naval vessel to be able to destroy Sierra's 500 tons of chemicals, including actual nerve age sarins, neutralizing them offshore with other chemicals in a process known as hydrolysis. It Italy, Norway, and Denmark have offered to transport Sierra's chemicals from the northern Syrian port of Latakia with military escorts. The chemicals would then be transferred to the U.S. ship at another airport. As you know, I've had the opportunity to brief this, uh, the Council for the second time. It's a monthly briefing, and we spoke on progress achieved to date. We spoke, of course, on the preparation for the very critical phase three, which is the removal out of country of the most critical chemical agents. We went a little bit into the details of the, the what and the how and the work of the joint mission, but of course also very mindful of the continuous uh, volatile conditions in country in an active war zone. Uh, in principle, uh, we're still awaiting confirmation by a member state that a port uh, is available for transloading, so it will be transloading in a port. And still to come in our program, protests continue in Ukraine's capital of Kiev. That and more after the break. Welcome back. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry reiterates that Israel's security is a top priority in talks with Iran 
on its controversial nuclear program after an initial deal was signed. Kerry's remarks were aimed at calming tensions with Israel over the interim deal reached in Geneva on November the 24th, which saw Iran agree to roll back parts of its nuclear program in return for limited relief from Western sanctions. The deal was roundly condemned by Netanyahu, who called it a historic mistake. Kerry landed in Israel late last night for a trip aimed at giving momentum to Israeli-Palestinian peace talks, which have made little apparent headway since they began under his patronage in late July. Kerry is due to present the outlines of a West Bank security plan in meetings with Israeli and Palestinian leaders. The proposal will mark the first time that Kerry has directly intervened in the peace talks since they began in late July. At least 20 people have been killed as a suicide bombing has rocked Yemen's defense ministry complex in the heart of the capital of Sana'a. The defense ministry says attacks was followed by a gun battle that left many casualties, including most of the gunmen in the firefight. The ministry says the attackers had targeted and badly damaged a hospital inside the complex, but that the situation is now under control. Foreign doctors and nurses are reported to be among the ones killed. The suicide explosion was reportedly caused by a bomber who drove a car packed with explosives into the gate. The blast was followed by another car of gunmen opening fire at the ministry. There was no immediate claim of responsibility for the attack. The trouble in Ukraine is far from over. Protesters continue to occupy the nation's central bank in Kiev while still camping around the main government buildings in the country's capital. Meanwhile, European officials have arrived to attend the Organization for Security and Cooperation meeting in Europe. More details in this report. Deputy Prime Minister Sergei Azarov says the government of Ukraine does not rule out discussing snap elections with the opposition ahead of a meeting of top European diplomats taking place in Kiev. He added that negotiations are ongoing and the government will discuss different proposals. The comments come after nearly two weeks of protests in Ukraine against the decision by the government not to sign a key political and trade agreement with the European Union. As protests continue to rage in the Ukrainian capital and other cities, three of the country's former presidents have given their support to the demonstrators. In a statement, Leonid Kravukchi, Leonid Kushma and Viktor Yushchenko expressed solidarity with peaceful rallies. The government is showing no sign of yielding and a resolution remains elusive. Azarov urged the opposition to end its blockade of government buildings and warned the western regions of the country where protest strikes were announced that they may be left without federal funding. Russian President Vladimir Putin dismissed the protests saying they are unrelated to Ukraine's turn away from the European Union and called for stability and order in neighboring Ukraine. In Brussels, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said there was very powerful evidence that Ukrainians want to be associated with the European Union and confirmed that the U.S. stood with the vast majority of them who want to see the future for their country. His words were echoed by U.S. State Department spokeswoman Victoria Nuland. This is Ukraine's moment to meet the aspirations of its people or to disappoint them and risk descending into chaos and violence. What happens here matters to all of us and to this organization. And the voices of the Ukrainian people today echo those of so many who came before them here and in other parts of the OSCE space throughout this organization's history. There should be no doubt where the United States stands on all of this. We stand with the people of Ukraine who see their future in Europe and want to bring their country back to economic health and unity. We also believe that our shared OSCE values and principles offer the only sustainable course to this future. All sides must renounce violence. Those who abuse human rights must face justice. The fundamental freedoms of expression and peaceful assembly must be respected. Events in the Ukrainian capital were garner further attention as officials including German Foreign Minister Guido Westerwell arrived for a two-day meeting of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Westerwell visited protesters on Independence Square, saying that the gates of the European Union are still open. Opposition leaders claim 10 protesters are still missing after clashes with police and asked prosecutors to investigate. On a wall near Independence Square, a poster hung seeking the whereabouts of a 16-year-old girl named Marina, who's been missing since a November 30th rally. 
China's foreign ministry says that visiting U.S. Vice President Joe Biden was told that Beijing's decision to set up a near defense identification zone in the East China Sea accorded with international law. Biden said that China's announcement of an air defense identification zone over the East China Sea had caused apprehension in the region and that he was clear about the U.S.'s stance on the move during talks in Beijing. But China's recent and sudden announcement of the establishment of a new air defense identification zone has, to state the obvious, caused significant apprehension in the region. And I was very direct about our firm position and our expectations in my conversations with President Xi. The United States has a profound stake in what happens here because we need and we are and will remain a Pacific power diplomatically, economically, and military. That's just a statement of fact. The only path to realizing this vision uh, for the future is through tangible, practical cooperation in managing our and managing our differences effectively. We've not tried this before. We've not tried this before. This is going to be difficult. And now for news around the world in brief, NASA's Cassini mission has captured an incredible high-resolution animation of the psychedelic jet stream known as Saturn's Northern Hexagon. The strange polygonal object is a continent-sized six-sided hurricane with 200 miles per hour winds that spins around Saturn's North Pole. Scientists are at a loss to explain exactly how the hexagon gets its perfect shape, but they suspect that it has to do with the way the jets interact with Saturn's gaseous atmosphere. At least seven people have died in Bangui, the capital of the Central African Republic, in the heaviest clashes in the city in months. This is according to the French charity Doctors Without Borders. The blasts of heavy and small arms gunfire were heard hours before France said that it would deploy 1,200 troops to restore order in the CAR, which has been in sectarian violence between Muslims and Christians. Items from some of the world's biggest music stars are hitting the block during Julien's Auction's annual rock and roll sale in Beverly Hills, California. The most expensive lot comes from Grateful Dead star Jerry Garcia. Elvis Presley has several items in the sale, including the only pair of blue suede shoes known to be owned by the singer during the sale, which will be held on December 6th and 7th. Over 70 lots from Michael Jackson will also go under the hammer. Ever wanted to try on Harry Hobbit feet, we wield Frodo's sword, or wear the one ring to rule them all? Fans of Peter Jackson's epic fantasy film series, The Lord of the Rings, will have the opportunity to bid on rare movie memorabilia. Props from Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy will be up for sale at Julien's auctions today, including a pair of prosthetic Harry Hobbit feet, worn by one of the film's main characters, Samwise Gamgee, the hairy feet are estimated to fetch between 15,000 to 30,000 US dollars. The total auction is expecting to fetch between $1 million and $1.5 million from the sale of 80 lots of memorabilia. Other highlights from the fantasy realm of Middle Earth include the sword of lead character Frodo Baggins, played by Elia Wood, estimated between 100,000 and 200,000 US dollars and a wizard staff belonging to Gandalf the White expected to fetch between $50,000 to $70,000. Well, you can actually put on the ring, Frodo's ring, and it might not make you invisible like in the movie, but you can certainly, you know, to some extent, uh, you know, experience that. But no, I mean, a lot of these uh, are the very iconic props from the films. We also have Frodo's sword and a lot of very identifiable pieces. So, you know, there's fans and collectors all over the world, and this is their opportunity to kind of take home a piece of it and really own it. This marks the end of our bulletin for today. Now for a reminder of our headlines. The Lebanese army begins fortifying its security measures in Tripoli in an attempt to control the situation in the city. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry reiterates that Israel's security is a top priority in talks with Iran. And at least 30 people are feared dead as a suicide bombing rocks Yemen's defense ministry complex in the capital. Those were your Thursday headlines from us here at Future Television. I'm Linda Tamim, wishing you all a very nice evening. Thank you.